a number of times here. For the benefit of the recording. <laughs> Once again, it gives me enormous pleasure to welcome Rabbi Akiva Tatz to our community. And of course, I've had the pleasure of welcoming him a number of times, and he really needs no introduction at all. For a long time now, he's been senior lecturer at a JLE in Golders Green, but has lectured all over this country, in fact, all over the Jewish world. Um, he's an expert not only in Torah, but in medicine, uh, in not just a qualified but practicing doctor, but in medical. ethics and really one as we have heard previously but today something completely different Purim and laughter Rabbi so thank you very much for this opportunity to um, once again be here and learn together I'd like to just start with a personal message to the rabbi to thank him for the programs we've done over the years and I'm sure I speak on your behalf to thank him for the kind and warm personal leadership that is uh, given to our community and we wish him a regretful uh, farewell but uh, we certainly hope you'll stay in touch um, if you invite me to do something with you in jerusalem be happy to happy to do it um, the subject of today's discussion is the question of humor and laughter can, can you hear me the back? What is, what is this noise? Is, oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But, um, can we switch it off? Is it possible? We'll get cold. What if I speak fast and we? <laughs> okay. If you can hear, that's okay with me. Um, so let's put our heads into this challenging subject. Not much written on it in Jewish sources, but I try to. Um, give a picture of this very interesting subject. Why are we talking about humor and laughter? Because the Sefer Yetzirah, one of our great Kabbalistic works, says that every month of the year corresponds to a different human faculty. That means that uh, every part of the body and every part of the function of the body is connected to a different month. The world is broken up into 12 meridia, 12 spiritual energies, if you like, and they correspond to 12 aspects of the body. <coughs> Some are pretty easy to understand. For example, Pesach, Nisan, the month of Nisan, is speech. We know that Pesach is about Pesach, the mouth speaks. The midst of the Haggadah is telling the story. You can see that without too much difficulty. And one of the months is, okay, is uh, connected with walking, with hearing, with seeing. And each of them has a long discussion about what the connection is. But Adar, this month, is laughter. And that raises a few interesting questions. Which part of the body is it, by the way? It's the spleen. The spleen. Now we'll take another discussion for <clears throat> some other time, <clears throat> what the spleen has to do with this. <clears throat> but the faculty of expression of the body that we call laughter is what characterizes this month. And that needs a lot of understanding. First of all, why is it important? Walking, speaking, seeing, these are fundamental things. But laughing? Could we not have survived without laughter? Why is it fundamental and, and central that there's a month of the year? That means one of the aspects of reality that is human laughter. That's challenging. So how do we approach a subject like this? We have a principle that is expressed by the Ramchal. And you find this in many other sources. And that is that the world we experience is a parallel of a higher world. I mean, this is heavy stuff for a Sunday afternoon. Are you? Is that okay? Do you have the you have the energy for some spiritual effort? You don't look that keen, I must say. <laughs> but this requires a bit of thinking and abstraction. But I think if we if we think about it deeply, we'll gain something from this. We have a principle that the world we experience is the parallel of a higher world. <laughs> The Ramchal, in his classic work, Dara Hashem, he calls it Kochot Nivdalim. That means everything you can experience is parallel to a transcendental force, a Koch Nivdal. And of course, that power is also like vested in something that is higher. And it's an endless chain all the way up to the source of reality. The most easy and obvious example is the human body. 
the body is a manifestation in the world, but there's a koach niftal, we call it the soul. The inner being, your personality, who you are as a person is more abstract, more refined. It is a higher level than the body. It animates the body, projects itself into the body. And although you can't see it, you certainly can, you certainly can relate to it. When any meaningful relationship with a human being is a relationship with their soul, not their body. Anyone who relates to another person as a body only is a very sordid and low version of human relationships. You need the body, absolutely. And in Judaism, we sanctify it. But there's something higher, which is called the soul. And the soul has a higher level. In fact, there are five levels of soul. But that's the principle, which means that the purpose of understanding the world is really in order to understand something higher. Again, let's take that example. When you relate to a human being, not interested in the body only, the point of the body is that it gives you access to the inner being and you watch the body carefully you watch its nuances of expression and its gestures and from the physical manifestation of a body you get to know the person who's inside exactly in that fashion you should be relating to the world when you look at a tree you should be seeing the spirit of the one who is in that tree right the point of looking at the physical world is not to see the physical world it is to see the spirit that animates it the point of engaging the physical world is like engaging the body to see the soul that animates and lives within the material world to get to know God, to put it, to put it bluntly. And therefore, anyone who looks at a human body and sees only meat is a very crude and vulgar distortion of what human relationships are. And anyone who looks at the physical world and sees only the material is a very vulgar distortion of what it means to be a human being. So far, so good. And therefore, the point of, of understanding the material world is to penetrate or elevate oneself into a deeper, a deeper reality. And that's the way a Jew should think. Everything that you can experience here is talking about something, something deep. And that applies to everything. Let's take something trivial. Something trivial. Our experiences, a trivial experience. People get homesick. Homesick, ask the South Africans. And the Talmud says, The charm of a place you come from is always deep in the heart of people who come from that place, even if it's not particularly nice. You could come from a place that's pretty mundane and be in a very beautiful place, but something tugs at your heart connected with the place you come from. Why? What does that represent in the higher world? And the answer is, well, why do you get homesick? Some people think because a few million years ago when you were a pigeon, you know, but that's not the way that you should think. The reason you long for home is because your soul is longing for the place it came from. Your neshama is longing for the spiritual world that it's carved out from. So it's translated and projected into the trivial world of emotions as homesickness. By the way, when people are home, they long to travel. Why? Because the neshama longs to move through the world to acquire its beauty and its real values of Torah and mitzvahs and meaningful relationships. And therefore, when you, when you note that the human being has a homesick, it's universal, not Jews, human beings. You ask yourself as a Jew, what does it mean? And it teaches you something about the spiritual world. Let's take a difficult example. That was easy. Let's take a difficult example. In the Hasidic world, they talk about dveikus. Dveikus means the effort to bond with God, to bond with Hashem in such an intense fashion that you lose all sense of ego and all sense of self in bonding into that higher reality. And paradoxically, when you do that, you discover more about yourself. What does that look like in our world? It should be marriage. What should marriage be? Marriage should be a giving of oneself so fearlessly and vulnerably and so intensely to somebody else that something larger than the individuals is constructed. And by giving yourself away in that relationship in such an intense love, paradoxically, you discover more about who you are. And what do you do with that newfound sense of identity? You put it back in. That's what a love relationship in a marriage should be. It's a lost art, I can assure you, as any good woman will tell you. But nevertheless, that's what it should be. So everything the Ramban talks about, he even talks about the intimate side of marriage and what it should be teaching you about the spiritual world. A Jew should look at everything in the world, no matter how mundane or practical, as something that is an avenue of access to something deep. That's the principle. And therefore, we have a wonderful tool. When the Torah talks about something spiritual, and we want to understand what it is, we have a wonderful tool. We look at what it is materially. The body's, the body's form, we call it B'Tselem Elohim. The human being is carved out in God's image. What does that mean? We have a principle, from my flesh I can see God. And that's a long discussion, how you can see from your foot and your hand and your eye something about the spiritual world. But that's what you're supposed to be doing. So let's apply that principle. The Torah talks about laughter. God sits in heaven and laughs. 
or as Yamala is Pinu, then when the final messianic re- reality is revealed in the world, a mouth shall be full of laughter. Or most peculiarly, a woman facing death laughs at the day of death. But Tishak Yom A woman of spiritual greatness can laugh at death. What do these statements mean? The answer is. If you want to know what it means spiritually, if you want to know what this deep aspect of Judaism is called laughter, examine it in the material world. Let's examine human humor and human laughter. And if we act, characterize it accurately, we'll have a deep insight into something amazing in the spiritual world. So let's do that. What is human laughter? First of all, it's very interesting that only humans laugh. Only humans laugh. There's no other part of the creation. There's no animal. Nothing else. Yes, I know hyenas lot, but I show you, <laughs> speaking as a South African, having watched them up close, they have no sense of humor, I can assure you. <laughs> but a sense of humor is uniquely human. That already sets it apart as something unique. And moreover, you can only laugh at something that's human. There's nothing a bicycle can do that can make you laugh, unless it looks like a person, then maybe that's funny. Or a person looks like a bicycle if you've got that sort of sense of humor. There's nothing a tree can do that can make you laugh. No part of the inanimate world can possibly make you laugh unless it distorts the human. Any distortion when a little baby looks like an old person, an old person looks like a baby, or some distortion of the human can make you laugh. But it has to have a human element. That's very interesting. So what makes us laugh? Again, I'm not talking spiritually. Let's talk practically. What makes you laugh? So there are many theories. If you look in the psychology and psychiatry of this area, There are classic works from Aristotle down to the present day. Very famous works, Freud. Freud has a whole massive book on laughter. It's called Der Witz, which means the joke and its connection to the unconscious. Written in turgid, heavy German. But uh, he wrote a whole book on jokes. Most of it, by the way, is full of anti-Eastern European Jewish jokes. You know, the Western European Jews thought they were sophisticated and uh, the Easterns were. But nevertheless, Freud does a masterful work (coughs) on analyzing what makes us laugh and fails to come to a final conclusion why his question is evolutionarily if humans laugh it must be very important we never involve things we evolve things only that have survival value what do we get that has survival value in laughter very perplexing a famous french philosopher of the last century henri bergson jewish also wrote seminal works and he wrote a classic work on laughter it's called the real which means laughter, a, 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 a masterful essay, extended essay on what laughter is and fails to come to a final conclusion about why would it be necessary for humans to laugh. And there are many other works written by psychiatrists and sociologists, fascinating study. So there are many theories. One is called the play theory. We laugh because it's a form of play and play is, a, is an expression of like little cubs and animals and children play, they're learning skills and so Laughter is a form of play. There's another theory called the superiority theory. You laugh because you feel superior. When someone slips on a banana peel and falls flat on his back, you laugh because it happened to you, it happened to him. There's a little truth in all of these theories, but none of them cover the whole spectrum. So there's a catharsis theory. That means when you laugh, you release spiritual tension because things are built up in one direction and suddenly you laugh in inarticulate expression of release. So it's a form of psychological release. There are many theories about laughter, but there's one theory that they all agree on, one feature that everyone agrees on. And here's the key. What makes you laugh is an unexpected inversion. When a thing goes in one direction and it looks like it has to go in that direction, you suddenly realize it was going completely the opposite way. The more sudden, the more extreme the tension, the, the disparity, the more you laugh. Or when two things are put together, they're absurdly opposite to each other. (coughs) The absurdity of the connection makes you laugh. Here's a tall, conceited, self-inflated individual. And the moment of his greatest dignity, he slips on a banana peel and falls flat on his back. Now, you have to be three years old to laugh at that. But as you, even as you run to help him up, you can't hide a smile because it's just so ridiculous. We hear some major politician making a very important speech. He doesn't know that a child has pinned a bushy tail to the back of his... I mean... And by the way, what's very interesting is these things that make you laugh, they aren't funny at all. Not funny. If you're going through them, you don't see the humor at all. So what is it that you're going through this thing? It's very embarrassing and humiliating. But if you're standing on the side, it's very funny. I mean, what does that mean? When you see a thing going in one direction and you realize that's not how it was, 
And professional comedians will do that. They'll take you in one direction. And when you least expect it, in the most extreme way, they flip it into the opposite. Mother says, Oscar, are you driving on the highway? She says, yes, mom. Oscar, I want you to be really careful. The police say on the radio, there's some crazy fellow going the wrong way on the highway. He says, mom, there's hundreds of them. <laughs> you see, when you realize, no, it wasn't going that way. It was going the other way. But that's not funny. That's dangerous. Why do you laugh at that? Well, it's like the, um, you know, there are two fellows on a, I, I can't like that. There were two fellows on a motorcycle. It was a very cold night. So the fellow in front put his jacket on backwards. You know, he put the jacket on with his arms through the, to break the wind. That's how they were riding. And they had a terrible accident, terrible accident. So when the emergency Hatsala responders got to them, they asked them afterwards, what did you find when you got to the scene of the accident? So they said, one fellow, unfortunately, didn't make it. The other fellow was doing okay until we tried to turn his head around the right way. <laughs> now, you know, what is funny about that? But the point is, when you, it doesn't go that way, it goes the opposite. So what is it in our psyche that makes us do that? You have this inarticulate expression of joy when you see a thing going not in one direction, but exactly the opposite. And paradoxically and amazingly, even if <laughs> that's not funny at all, even if the protagonists are experiencing misery, what does that mean? What is that telling us about the spiritual world? And the answer is that the spiritual world is built on this principle of human because the world is a progression through tragedy. But that tragedy that we're experiencing will one day invert itself into ecstasy. And then you'll realize that every element of pain caused the joy. That's very funny. Purim. What is Purim? Purim is the story of somebody trying to kill the Jewish people. Kill the whole Jewish people. Genocide on one day. And it turns out that unknown to him, every move that he makes is guaranteeing our survival and re reanimation into a whole new phase of Jewish history and his destruction. It's not funny when you're going through it. But spiritually, it's very funny. The major says that Haman made a gallows and he prepared it for Mordechai. And he was, wanted to be so sure that it would be correct. The major says he climbed up and he put his neck in the noose to make sure it fitted. And the major says the angel Gavriel came down and said, suits you. <laughs> this is not funny when you're going through it. But, and then you suddenly realize that everything he did that spelt our destruction is, is in fact our redemption and his destruction. That's very funny. Again, it's not. This is the hilarity of Purim, by the way. This is why in Purim we rejoice in this way. We hide. Why do we even mask on Purim? To show that it's not what you think. It's not that way. It's exactly the opposite. This looks like the ultimate destruction of the Jewish people, a total genocide. What happened in Europe 80 years ago was nothing compared to what they wanted. There, at least, there were Jews in other parts of the world who survived. But Haman was in charge of every single Jew on earth. And there was an international decree to kill every Jew on one day. And that led to an acceptance of Torah that we call the oral law, which was unprecedented. Pharaoh, Paroi, he's sitting on his throne. Listen to this for a joke. He's sitting on his throne and he's issuing a decree to kill all the children. By the way, the major says he meant Egyptian boys as well. You know, his advisors couldn't tell him whether the redeemer would be a Jew or an Egyptian. And of course they couldn't because Moshe, Moses, was partly an Egyptian. He was raised as an Egyptian prince and partly Jewish. So because the advisors could not tell him whether the usurper of his throne would be Jewish or not, he made a decree to kill all babies, all the boys who were born at the time. So here's this great king, king of an empire, sitting on his throne with a decree to kill all the babies. And on his knee, he's raising the child. That is great. That is very funny. Not only does he fail, he turns out to be the cause of his own failure. Yosheb HaShemayim Yisrael, Hashem is God is sitting in heaven and he's laughing at what's going on in the world. Again, it's not funny when you're going through it. It's only funny when you're watching from the side. The most extreme version of humor in Jewish thinking is death. I know it sounds bizarre and it may not be easy to get our heads around and facing it up close is not funny. But if you have a bigger vision of life, there's nothing as funny as that. We say a woman of spiritual greatness, she can laugh at the day of death. What does that mean? Incidentally, why a woman? 
And why is it our practice to sing that on Shabbat? We sing on Shabbat. We stand on Friday night, we look at our wives, and we sing a song of praise of a Jewish woman. And one of the lines is that this woman can laugh at the day of death. What does that mean? And I'll tell you what it means. It means that a woman is a creature who goes through that experience in her flesh. You know, a woman is a person who experiences what seems to be certain death, and that's childbirth. A man has no concept of what that is. Childbirth is an experience of two people going through a process that looks like, a, a ladies, I don't mean to put you off. I mean, I'll show you'll enjoy it and, you know, it'll be wonderful, but don't expect a man to go through that. The Rambam, who was a doctor, puts it something like this, and many sources talk about it, but the Rambam puts it something like this. He says, when a woman's in labor, it looks like two people are dying. First of all, the mother definitely looks like she's dying. I always say to the men, speaking as a doctor, I say, imagine you are a person who has no idea how babies come into the world. You think it has something to do with the stalk. And you, you, what, you're walking the corridors of your local hospital looking for the accounts department when you accidentally take a wrong turn and you step into the labor ward and you watch up close a woman giving birth for the first time. You know, you'd probably call the police. I mean, you know, you, I, I, you'd need therapy, that's for sure. And if you had to go through it yourself, you would never recover for the rest of your life. And yet what she's going through, every pain that she experiences is another effort to bring a life into the world. It's not funny when you're going through it, but when you've been through it and you realize that every pain and every seemingly impossible difficulty was a necessary element to bring a child into the world, that is very funny. But that's nothing compared to what the baby goes through. Do you know what happens to a child in the womb? A baby in the womb is constructed in such a way that he's adapted perfectly for his environment in the womb, underwater, without air to breathe. But every condition that keeps him alive in the womb spells immediate death when he's born. Guaranteed. A child in the womb has underwater with no air to breathe. He has no lungs. The lungs in a baby in the womb are tiny little scrunched up bits of tissue. They're almost unrecognized. Do you know how the police tell if a child was still born, let's say a body of a baby is found and the forensic team needs to know, was this child still born or did it live and then die? You know what they do? They take a piece of the lung and they put it in water. If it sinks, the baby never breathed because it's compressed. It looks like a bit of liver tissue. But if the child breathed and the lungs open, they become like sponges and they float. But in an unborn child, the lungs are tiny. There are holes in the heart. The blood flows in the wrong direction in a child. He's got blood vessels coming out through his umbilicus with blood flowing in that, in that direction. One of the biggest blood vessels in the body in a baby takes the blood all from the lungs in the opposite direction instead of towards the lungs. He has a different sort of blood. He has 25 conditions that keep him alive in the womb, each of which spells death within two minutes after he's born. And you have 25 conditions in your body that keep you alive, that if you gave any of them to the fetus in the womb, you'd kill him immediately. This is not just a different mode. This is a life and death opposite, which means the child is living in the womb in a condition that keeps him alive with many guaranteed variables that the moment within two minutes, two and a half minutes after he's born is guaranteed to die. And speaking as a doctor, again, I've delivered dozens of babies. You deliver this little child, you hold him in your hands. First, he goes blue. Then he goes purple, makes these terrible gasping movements before his lungs open. He's bleeding like crazy through the umbilical vessels. There's no hope for this child. And as you hold that little baby in your hand, suddenly the cord clamps down like a cable of steel and stops the bleeding. At exactly the same moment, the holes in the heart close in the blood reverses direction. At exactly the same moment, the blood vessel from the lungs clamps down, the blood hits the lungs. At exactly the same moment, he takes his first breath. And about three minutes later, it's all reversed and he's doing fine. That must have taken a good number of orangutans in the trees to get right during evolution. You know, there must have, there must have been a lot of chimpanzees that didn't make it. You're talking about a whole constellation of variables, each of which needs to be reversed within moments. And death leads to, that is very funny. That is very funny. And a woman has been through that in her flesh. She's been in that experience where she feels the pains of labor and knowing that the child is opposite disposed to what it needs to be. And suddenly a few minutes later, all of that spells Spells life. You know, if you'd like to look this up, there's a classic work on death and dying that's called Gesher Achaim. And there, it's a book of the laws, a classic 
halachic work about the laws of mourning and death loyal and in the third section of that work he gives some kabbalistic insights kabbalistic spiritual not halachic but deeper insights into what death and dying is and he speaks there in a in an unforgettable metaphor about children in the womb two twins in the womb he's talking about standing at a graveside when he's being buried what should you feel at a time like that through the pain he says imagine two twins in the womb living this idyllic experience we call it who could give me like those months when i spent when hashem surrounded me in my mother's body and these two twins living this perfect something these tremors begin and the one is thrust out into a world of guaranteed death the child remaining behind in the womb mourns for the brother who must have died little does he know that that's where life begins he says that you should feel standing at a grave when somebody of course you feel the pain it's not funny when you're going through it but you need a, a deeper and broader vision to know that that's where something only begins after all the, the our sages called the womb a grave and those are the parallels so you have this and it's a woman you know that there's no accident that we speak about the messianic advent as a birth. We call it Chevle Mashiach. We talk about that when the Mashiach will arrive, we call it a birth. We call it birth pangs of the Mashiach. You know why? Because the messianic process will be something that looks like we are finally destroyed. All the proofs will be against us. And after we get through that, and the only faculty you have to get through that is called Emona. Emona means the faith. Of course, faith is not based on historical emotion it's based on a history it's based on torah it's based on the fact that we've seen this time and again through history where the humorous inversion takes place but nevertheless when you're going through the labor and the birth it's not not pleasant but faith will get you through if a woman in labor knows that these pains are bringing life to the world it makes it a completely different experience and there, therefore when the mashiach arrives at the end of history it will be an experience where we look and many commentaries say there'll be proofs that we are wrong and everyone else is right and all will get you through. The only thing that will get you through is the strength of a woman giving birth in the world who knows that this will lead to life. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. If you have a collection of Midrashim called Bet Midrash. Going back uh, to the time of the, of the Mishnah. This merger says that just before the Mashiach comes, listen carefully to this. Just before the Mashiach arrives, the Arabs will have a building where the temple should stand. This matter was written four centuries before Islam became a religion. Our sages knew that. On the Temple Mount, there will be a building. And just before the Mashiach arrives, the Jews, whoever they may be at the time, they go to the leaders of the Arabs and they say, remove your building. We wish to build our temple. And the Arabs say, no, it's our holy place. Sound familiar? Then the Arabs turn to the Jews. There's no mistaking who they are. They're called the Bnei Arvim. And one man just calls it Melech Arvim. Bnei Yishmael, it says in one place. So there's no mistaking who they are. The Arabs turn to the Jews and they say, why should we battle? Let's make a divine test. You Jews build an altar like in the days of old. We'll build an altar, Mizbech. You put a sacrifice on yours. We'll put a sacrifice on ours. And let's see fire comes from heaven for one of our offerings. We got faith. We trust that God will reveal himself correctly. Right? In case you haven't noticed, the Muslim world has immense faith. One of the great rabbis of this generation said, Halavai Aleinu, that we should have that go through death itself if necessary for God. So let's make a test. You Jews put a sacrifice. We'll do the same. Let's see which one God accepts. But we make a deal with you. If your God, if God accepts your offering, we follow the Torah. But if he accepts our offering, you follow our religion. And the Jews agree. The major says that the Jews build an altar. They put a sacrifice. It doesn't say where. We read this a couple of weeks ago in the, the par parallel, right? With Elio, by the Carmel. The Jews build a thing and they put a thing. The Arabs build an uh, um, uh, altar. They put a sacrifice on. And fire comes from heaven to accept the Arabs' offering. This is a process of faith where the proofs are against you. Can you go through this? So the Arabs turn to the Jews and they say, We had a deal. The Jews say, Never. Shema Yisrael, Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem Echad. There's a battle. Those who survive flee to the desert. And after 30 days of hiding in the desert, the Mashiach arrives. 
It's a very beautiful medrash. It says the Mashiach arrives, he goes to Hebron, he wakes up Avram Yisak and Yaakov, he leads them out of the Machpelah, very extended and beautiful medrash. I once asked my great teacher of Simcha Vasaman, will it be like that? He said it will be exactly like that. In other words, a birth process, where the evidence is against you, and only if you get through that, And that's called humor. That's called Vatishrak and Yom Acharon. The only difference is if you have to wait till it happens to laugh. But if you're big enough, you can laugh at it beforehand. As Yamale, that's it, you can't laugh fully. In fact, the Gemara says the verse that says, As Yamale, Pinu, then our mouth shall be filled with laughter, has halachic import. You know, there's an there's a axiom that every word of Torah has halachic importance, not only poetic and, and emotional, there's some practical law. What law do we learn from the verse that says, then our mouth shall be full of laughter? The Gemara says, you should, not, you should not laugh fully now. In a world full of tragedy, we never laugh fully. Even at a wedding, they break a glass, we put ashes on the husband's head, you build a home, you have a little piece of wall and, and plastered. It's inappropriate to have a mouth full of laughter. You should laugh. Even in sad times, you should be joyful. A little less joyful, a little more joyful. But a mouth full of laughter is only going to be felt in the final revelation, when the final inversion reveals its humor. And if you think about it, this is everything that Judaism is. Who is the first Jewish child ever born? Yitzchak. And his name means laughter. Strange name for a child. Why is his name laughter? Because he's born when it's impossible. What's the story? His mother is much too old. Gamal says she had no womb. 90 years old. Father, 100 years old. <laughs> So the angels appear and tell them you'll have a child. Of course they laugh. Of course, of course, laughter is the inarticulate, joyful response to a thing being exactly the way it seems. Of course they laugh. And what's the child's name? Of course, they name him laughter. He's a manifestation of the impossible. And some child, not just a child born in the world. This child will live an eternal, <clears throat> raise an eternal nation from a complete impossible background. And that's called Yitzchak. What happens when Yitzhak is old enough to have his own children, to get married and start the Jewish people? At that point, God says to his father, great, now kill him. This is a real comedy, you understand? The, the Torah is a real comedy. He's not old enough to get married. God says, now I want you to kill him. So Avram takes him, he, builds a, he, puts his, he, puts him, he takes his neck, he takes the knife, and God says, kill him. You know, the Gemara says, you know how they teach the children? You know, Abraham was a very old man at that time. He was 136, 137. He'd waited all that time for this child. He loved him so dearly. Emotionally, how could he do it? He taught the world that human sacrifice is wrong. It was a very difficult emotional move, but he went through it for God's sake. That is wrong. I'm sorry to tell you, it's wrong. He had no emotional difficulty. He wasn't conflicted about it. All our sources tell us that when Abraham, when Avram was about to kill Yitzchak, he was doing it with the joy of fulfilling a mitzvah. The joy of Simcha Shal Mitzvah. There are many proofs for it. I'll give you one proof. As he's about to cut his throat, he heard a voice call out to him to stop. The Ral Bug, one of our great commentaries, says that the reason we know Avram was joyful at that moment is because a man cannot hear the voice of prophecy if he's distressed. To hear a godly call to stop, you can only, a prophet can only receive prophecy when he's in a state of joy and serenity. So he must have been in a state of total serenity at that moment. And he's fired him here. And he's fired him. Anybody? Not one. Well, you should look in our compatriots, the Svardim. I think maybe a Chumash fell down, maybe something. If you look in the in the Machsor of the Svardim, you'll see something exquisitely beautiful. We Ashkenazim don't have this. But on Yom Kippur, they have an amazing piyut in which they describe the Akeda and Avram about to kill Yitzhak. And you know what it says there? It says. He was about to kill him with an eye of tears for his son's death and a heart rejoicing for the fulfillment of a mitzvah. So what was the problem? It wasn't emotionally difficult. The problem was it was an impossible act. That's the problem. Listen to how the Gemara puts it. The Gemara says that when Avram was asked to kill his son Yitzchak, Hashem was asking him to do something that was completely impossible. Not impossible in human terms, impossible in godly terms. How do we know it? Because the verse says, I never wanted this, I never considered it, and then never occurred to me 
This is God speaking. That means when I asked you to kill your son, I was asking you to do something that I no way wanted. And of course, Hashem didn't want it. And he stopped him. Which means this. Avram is moving towards that fateful moment. He's about to take his son and cut his throat. And he looks up and he says, as the beloved knows the heart of the beloved, he knew that God could not. Never mind me. There's no way you could want this. And Hashem says, correct. So take the knife and kill him. So he's about to kill him. And he looks up and he says, Hashem, never mind me. You could not want this. And God says, right, I don't want it. Now kill him anyway. A complete intellectual impossibility. And what happens? So the Chumash says he stopped. The Zohar says he killed him. The Zohar says the ashes of Yitzchak are, remain piled on the, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the Mizbeach. Well, one second, did he die or not? Both. So the Zohar says what happened is as the knife approached his neck, his soul left him. And as the life rece knife receded, his soul came back. That's called Tchiyas Amesim. Some sources say that Avram even made the brocha al Tchiyas Amesim at that moment. So what happened? This is a young man who gets killed and remains alive at the same time. And what's the irony in the paradox? Because he goes through that death experience, he becomes an indestructible, immortal human being. He then founds a nation that survives the next 4,000 years of the entire world trying to kill us, and we're the only ones who are still here. That's very funny, my friends. The Tikkun Ezra says the word Yitzhak spells Ketz Chai, death in life. The name, break it down, Ketz Chai, the next world in this world. And Yitzhak becomes a man who walks through this world with his feet in this world and his head in another world. That's very funny. The more they try to kill us, the more indestructible we will become. It's not funny when you're going through it. True. Yitzchak means the last laugh. That's what we're looking for. And wherever you look at Jewish history, you see Yosheh B'Shemayim Yitzchak. The one who's sitting above it is laughing at what's happening. The more they try to pervert his way in the world, the more they build it. That's what free will is. Free will is only which method you choose. There's no free will about the end product. There's no free will about your perfection. There's no free will about the Jewish people's perfection. There's no free will about world history. In it, there's no, those are not open. Those are not options. Your choice is which route will you choose to get there? More difficult, less difficult. <clears throat> but in the end, the humor is that no matter what you do, you build the same result. The Gemara says that, there's so many examples. The Gemara says that um, one day King Solomon how long am I, supposed, am, I, am I taking someone else's time right now? Another couple of minutes? That's not an alarm to tell me to stop, right? <laughs> couple of minutes. Huh? Uh, the Gemara says like this, one day King Solomon saw the angel of death. Shlomo Melech, angel of death, and was looking sad. So Shlomo went up to him and he said to him, what are you so sad about? So the Malach Amav said, you know, I was sent to take the souls of two people to kill two individuals, and I'm having trouble. I can't take them. Shlomo heard the names of these two people. They were friends of his, associates. So instantaneously, using special spiritual techniques, he had them sent to the town of Luz. Luz is a town in which people cannot die. The Malach Amav cannot enter. The angel of death cannot enter the town of Luz. <clears throat> he heard that he was gunning for them. <clears throat> Their lives were in danger. <clears throat> he sent them instantly to the town of Luz. As they arrived at the gates of the city, they both died. So the next day, Shlomo saw the angel of death. He was joking, you're a happy mood. So he said to him, what are you so happy about? He said, you know those two people I was meant to take yesterday? You know what my trouble was? My instructions were to take them at the gates of Luz, and I was having trouble getting them there. Very interesting. Very interesting. So what turns out, Shlomo used his free will, the wisest man on earth, used his free will for the greatest mitzvah, saving lives, and played right into the hands of the angel of death. You're not going to escape the consequences. Uh, and by the way, I believe he has the mitzvah there of saving life. No question is what he had to do. You make your choices, but you play into the hands of a destiny <clears throat> that is waiting to happen. And in the end, you see the humor. I'll give you one more example. How do the Jewish people begin? So the brothers go down to Egypt. Joseph is this weird Egyptian tormentor. They have no idea who it is. <clears throat> And he's putting them through hell. Little do they know that this is their long lost brother who's trying to put them through exactly the same situation they were in 20 years before, 22 years before, and this time get it right. Then they, they betrayed, they dropped a brother, son of Rachel Imenu. This time he wants to give them the opportunity to do the same thing and this time get it right, to expiate and correct 
what they did before. They don't know what the stakes are. They see this weird Egyptian with these bizarre requests, tormenting them after years of torment. And finally, there's no hope left. After all this backwards and forwards and unintelligible torment, they stand in front of Joseph for the last time. And he says to them, you can go. Just leave your, your brother, ben Benjamin, with me. At that moment, Yehuda, who was leading the brothers, the Swasemis says, he had no options left. There were only two options that faced those great men. One was to destroy everybody. They were superhuman in strength, become mass murderers, kill everybody and take their brother. Kill everybody, the whole Egyptian society. The other was to leave him behind and go home and kill their father. The major says if Yaakov would have seen them in the distance and realized that Binyamin was not with him, he would have died of grief on the spot. So after 22 years of torment, knowing that they had perverted the course of history and failed miserably, disaster had become crisis, and there were no options left. You either kill everybody and, or you go and kill your father. At that moment of impossibility, Yehuda steps forward and he says to Yosef, I have no idea what's going on. I know we're guilty. We made a mistake and we're guilty. But what is going on, you have no idea. But I know one thing. I promised my father that I'd bring him home. And therefore, take me. And at that moment of self-sacrifice, with absolutely no possibility of redemption, they hear the words, Ani Yosef. That is very funny. You, the source of the problem. It's not the cavalry riding in from left stage or the, the sheriff. You! At that moment, of course, they were shocked into paralysis. They couldn't move. The murderer says he had to kiss them. He had to show them he was circumcised. He had to speak to them in Hebrew. They were too shocked to move. It's not funny when you're going through it. But when you're watching from the side and you suddenly realize that at that moment, they realized that every moment of agony had been a correction that was absolutely necessary. They wouldn't give up a moment of it now. Like a woman giving birth to a child who realizes that every pain of her labor was necessary to produce this life in the world. That is the humor of Jewish history. And so we say, a person correctly spiritually disposed can laugh at the end of history. When you realize that things are not going the way you thought they're going in the opposite direction. Then you'll see that the direction was not the one you thought of, but Jews have an opposite direction. I'll leave you with this thought. One thought and a story. Here's the thought. What's the practical output of this? You're sitting there thinking, well, this is spiritual ideas, but you know, I'm a practical person. I'll tell you the practical. The practical is that the world one day is going to be turned upside down. All the values of the world around us, ridiculous wars, where it's worth killing people over. The world will be inverted into a correct form. The practical message, live upside down now. That's you should walk around in this world on your head. Let them laugh at you. It's fine. You live values opposite to theirs. We live in a world of ridiculous and, and murderous. Every value antithetical common sense, that alone is spiritual. As a Jew, you look around on your head. One day the world will be turned upside down. You'll be the right way. That's not the way it is. That's called lost love. I'll leave you with a story to illustrate this. In South Africa, there's a, um, every country has a figure who's the butt of all jokes, no? Yes? I don't know who he is here, maybe somebody Irish. I don't know. South Africa, there's one. So they, they tell a story, he's driving with his friend, and they come to a red light, and his friend goes straight through the red light. He says to him, what are you doing? It's so dangerous. He says, no, my, my brother always does. They come to the next red light, and he accelerates right through the light. He says, well, get us killed. He says, don't worry, my brother always does. Third red light, it goes straight through the red light. How can you do such a thing? Don't worry, my brother always does. The next light is green. Screeches to a halt. He says, what are you doing now? He says, no, in case my brother's coming. <laughs> Anyone like to ask questions? We have some time. Yes. Just 
open a special status for somebody who really died. I'm talking from a spiritual, a, a, a Jewish religious point of view. Is there a special status for someone like that? Who's physically dead, let's say, for a significant amount of time, maybe two, three minutes, whatever, and then they're brought back? Is there something special about that? Are, a, are you asking in general, or would they experience a humorous experience? You're asking in general, not related to humor. The question was these so called episodes of clinical death where people were collapsed and, to all intents and purposes, died, then they were revived and they have visions and uh, describe. I, I hate to disappoint you. I, I think those are completely worthless. Completely worthless. First of all, this is not our subject directly today, but I think they're worthless. First of all, the person did not die. They didn't die. The proof is they came back to life. Again, Death, we define logically as irreversible, irreversible cessation of all bodily functions. If you can come back after having died and you weren't dead, first of all, which means it's very dubious whether you can learn about the death process from somebody who sort of was about to die or in the process of dying, but did not die. So how can we trust that as a death experience? And even if you can, no one has ever done that and come back and told us anything we didn't know anyway. We... For that, that's point one. But point two is, let's say it's a valid experience. Let's say they did die and they came back. They tell us about amazing light and looking at themselves from the outside. The Talmud tells us all of that. So what do we need this experience for? If it helps you with your faith and helps you believe that the soul is a real thing, that could be useful. And I think they are very, very, I don't see the significance or the importance. If somebody went through that and came back and told me something that no one could have possibly known or new information, that might be worth considering. But they don't tell us anything new. They tell, again, the Talmud has a description of what dying feels like, relatives coming to greet you, and many parameters. If, you, if, you, if you'd like to hear somebody who dies, what they call clinical death, which is really a meaningless term, and then is revived, there's a very real question, which is, did they die and then they were re revived? Is that called chersamesim, resurrection of the dead? Or were they potentially about to die and then they were revived? It has massive significance, for example, Let's say we say two views. One view is the person died. Their heart stopped, all breathing stopped, everything stopped. And then we brought them back. That's called resurrection of the dead. The other opinion is no, if they could be revived, they weren't yet dead and you saved their life. Listen to the consequences. If you say that the person died, and this was Tchir Samesim, resurrection of the dead, number one. If you're a Kohen, get the heck out of there. Because you're not allowed to be with a dead person. Never mind reviving, get out. Secondly, there's no mitzvah to revive the dead. Just leave him. Thirdly, when you bring him back, he has to remarry his wife. He has to beg his kids for a cup of coffee because they just inherited every penny that he owns. <laughs> um, you know, it, there are massive consequences. Life insurance is more... Well, no. For example... Let's say while he was in that state, his, his wife was conducting an intimate relationship with some other man. A little insensitive, you understand. But let's say she was. No problem. She was a merry widow. <laughs> she wasn't a married woman. On the other hand, if you say that that limbo state is not yet dead, then when he comes back to life, he doesn't have to remarry his wife. His kids never inherited him. You understand? The consequences are massive. And it's a real question. Not only when someone collapses. Let's say during heart surgery, they stop the heart. During heart transplantation, they take the heart out and they drop it in a bucket. Then they pick up the new heart and they walk over. At that moment, he's definitely not alive because he doesn't got a heart in his body. That's a definition of death. So a person going through heart surgery has to remarry his wife, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> so this is a serious question. And the great rabbis of this generation have ruled death is irreversible cessation of all of those things, not a limbo state from which you can be brought back. You understand? So it's a real, real question. And I think we should take the view that such people have not died. They're in some potential death limbo states. So they come back. So I'm not saying there's any wrong with it or, there's, or they're lying or it's harmful in any way, but I just don't think it's worth much to us. Any question that I can? Yes. Um, no question here. Humor is a bit different from Yes, this is more comment, I think, than a question, but somebody at home is commenting that humor is a very valuable and useful tool. It oils relationships and helps us make friends. I think that's fine. And I think that as Jews, we probably have survived because we can laugh at the disasters around us, right? If we took them too seriously 
how would we have survived? And I think that's quite correct. What you said, it looks like that I value in survival situations. Yeah, indeed. Jews have a talent be, for being able to laugh even in critical situations. And I think it's carried us through. I think it shows spiritual resilience and uh, amazing approach to life. Yes, any final questions? Okay, so we are looking forward to the time where we say, then our mouth shall be full of laughter. True, it is not a joke or fun as we go through it, but we need to have a bigger vision to understand. To be able to relate to Vatishak Yom Acharon, we need to know that as we go through Purim, that inversion of Purim, where everything goes in one direction and everything is inverted, that's our motto, so to speak, as we go through life. Thank you. Rabbi Tatz, many thanks once again for uh, illuminating an area that we probably thought we understood. Laughter on Purim. When we laugh this Purim, just remember the whole scene looked one way and then it was, not only was it completely turned upside down, but the very vehicle that, uh, vehicles that Haman used to attain his goals actually tell the whole story the other way. He was the victim of his own efforts and we thank God for the, uh, we, we, we succeeded because of it and all the other examples that Robert Tetz brought uh, and it's really stimulating talk. Thank you so much.